Five Five seconds, so I you know, so I can sit up straight. We're live, guys. We are... Oh yeah, I see it. Cool. Isn't that cool? Now I'm trying to see how I can find it on my phone. I make sure your phone's on mute because we'll have some feedback, but um, I'm gonna turn this into a watch party. So this is- Oh, there we go. The personal page, it's gonna be on the uh, doing the thing page. Um, all right, guys, how y'all doing? Right on. Hey, good, good afternoon. <laughs> So Gary, it's great to have you on again. This is our first live show, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll roll with the punches, right? So we're probably going to have some weird hiccups and things like that, uh, but we're going to make this uh, we're going to make this count. So so we have some videos to share with everybody. Uh, we're going to wait a little bit until some more people get on, so that we can engage with them and and speak with them a little bit further. Um, but Phil, you had a couple of things you wanted to say too, right? Yeah, now I'm hearing a little bit of uh, echo in the background. Maybe I need to stop talking back and forth from my microphone. No. <laughs> no, you know what it might be? Yeah, I think I know what it is. But yeah, go on. Can you still hear me? Loud and clear. I can hear you. Beautiful. Yeah, hey, uh, so first of all, Gary, it is such an honor to join you on um, the anniversary of your summit, my friend, to celebrate that day with you is, uh, touches my heart to be here. So, man, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And, uh, you know, in celebration of this day, right, the day you summited Mount Everest, we want to talk about, like, what was it like, you know, Camp 4 and Hillary Step and standing on top of the world and all those cool things, right? And many people who join or listen or watch this uh, episode after perhaps don't know a lot about that experience. So, man, hearing it from you and uh, but here's the thing, you know, and hearing about that push from Camp Florida Summit, um, it's just going to be, I think, really, really awesome uh, for folks. It, but you know, in addition to this being a day of celebration, it's also a day to honor the personal sacrifices made and to pay tribute mm -hmm. to those who were lost along the way. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true, you know. I mean, today is always uh, it's a little bittersweet, but, you know, first of all, uh, as I was discussing with you, with you earlier, Phil, that, uh, you know, a big shout out and a big thank you for all the people over all the years, you know, that have uh, assisted me, stuck with me, not given up on me and uh, supported me either financially or personally or just a pat on the back or helped me get up when I, when I fell. You know, I always say through my addictions, my afflictions and my successes and my failures, you know, ultimately, uh, you folks were, were were the ones I thought about when I when I when I finally made it to the top of the world, right? Because you know, you've heard me say before, Phil, that uh, there's been times in my life when I've given uh, plenty of people the opportunity not to stick by me, and uh, you know, some some haven't, but uh, you know, thank goodness, uh, a lot have, and uh, you know, so much of those last few steps were for those people and family and friends and clients and sponsors. And of course, a shout out to the Coalition of Texans with, Disability, with Disabilities. They do a lot of hard work for people that are quite challenged physically or, or mentally. And, uh, you know, the whole purpose, the main purpose of the whole expedition, this particular expedition was to raise awareness to the potential of all people, including those with, with disabilities. And saying all that, you know, it was uh, one of the most favorite moments of my life, you know, on this day, you know, a number of years back to arrive at the summit at, you know, 1232, to be exact. Uh, <laughs> and then in some regard, it's also very, you know, it's a bitter, it's bittersweet. Uh, you know, I lost a brother, uh, a Sherpa brother, a young Sherpa brother on the same, uh, on the same day. I wasn't when, with him when he passed. I was with him, uh, you know, 24 hours prior. And, you know, my memory, I can still picture him laughing and smiling and we were joking because he was like my kid's brother, you know, in the tent at Camp 4. And then, uh, you know, something happened to him. And, uh, 
unfortunately, uh, you didn't make it back down to base camp. Uh, and obviously I'm still in touch with his brothers and his family. And, uh, they know that I think about him and, uh, appreciate, uh, you know, his, uh, his role in my life and, uh, and that of his family. And, uh, you know, so I think about that as well. Uh, but I'm very appreciative and very grateful and, uh, uh, very pleased, uh, you know, to be able to share it and to, to have achieved that goal and to, and to be here today, right? I mean, it's the 23rd of May. There's a lot of negative things happening in the world right now. And it's tough and it's tough times for folks. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I reflect back on this expedition, you know, with the team that went with me to base camp and, uh, you know, the sacrifices that they endured and, you know, just that, that human spirit, that hope and that belief and that compassion with each other that, you know, when we have those elements in our, in our life that, uh, you know, most things within reason are, are achievable for sure. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, of course. And, uh, yeah, thank you guys for uh, inviting me. It's, uh, it's just a special day, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah, to share with all those that are able to join us today and certainly – uh, you know, the video will post and some other things. And so let's start here, Gary. Um, obviously, working with you on the book, I got very familiar with the whole expedition process through Everest, right? But some people tuning in and, and listening may not understand first, like, what do you have to do to get to a place like Base Camp or what comes before that? And so if you can maybe lay out, I'm going to relive this journey with you, right? If you can start just kind of by laying out what that whole thing looks like to get to that first big increment, right? Yeah. I mean, on Everest, on the, on the south side, on the Nepali side, you know, have a base camp of 17,500 feet. And obviously they call it for base camp uh, for a reason. You sort of set up camp there for the duration of the whole expedition, which approximately is about six to eight weeks after you get to base camp, right? And then from base camp, you establish four higher camps with your Sherpa friends, uh, camp one, two, three, and four. And each of these camps are at two. And the idea is leave base camp, let's say the firm gear, let's say up to camp one. You may drop that gear and return immediately back down to base camp, or you may spend the night at camp one and then return to base camp the next day. And what this does, it sort of allows your body to acclimate to the higher altitudes. And then when you're back at base camp and you, you uh, find some more energy, you take some, maybe some equipment and some food up to camp one and then make another run to, to or make a first run to camp two. And again, maybe spend the night and then return back to base camp. And you sort of do this yo-yo effect for about six to eight weeks and the idea is that you try to sort of sleep high as they say i mean climb high and then sleep low and then each time you then re-enter that higher altitude your 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 body is a little better acclimated to it so you're a little bit stronger and the idea is that, that after six weeks or so of doing this when the jet stream moves away from let's say the summit ridge you're acclimated enough to actually make that push to the very very summit uh, and, you know, again, a lot of people don't realize that it's not sort of, you know, three or four days after you get to base camp, you stand on top of the world. There is some thought, thought out, I think, strategy and, and luck and support and having great Sherpa with you and, uh, you know, not really uh, wanting to give up and being persistent and being determined because uh, a lot of things can happen to you very easily, even at, you know, 17 and a half thousand feet, you're much more susceptible to colds and getting sick and not feeling well and perhaps having other altitude issues or stomach issues, or you just flat out miss home or you get nervous. Uh, so it takes some time and a lot of patience and committed to hopefully a, a, a positive and safe outcome. That's amazing, man. Probably took That's uh, a lot Whoa. <laughs> ton of training to even get ready for that. Uh, did you go out to Colorado or anywhere, do some high altitude, you know, sensitization or training or anything? I, I did a little bit. I mean, it's very hard to sort of prepare in advance, right? Uh, but I was down in, in South America a couple of months prior and I was in Africa a few months prior to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had a good build up, you know, with the team that came with me, Mount Everest Base Camp, you know, the largest, uh, really the most diverse team ever, but we had folks on that base camp team with varying degrees of physical and cognitive challenges. Uh, and we had a few extra days within that itinerary to get to base camp in, in a safe and happy and healthy manner as we possibly could. So that time over, you know, almost three weeks really allowed my body to acclimate at those, uh, at, at the higher altitude. 
uh, yes, but to answer your question, yes, a lot of training was involved, a lot of uh, a lot of mornings uh, early, and you know, again, going back to you know, I have a number of friends that would train with me, and uh, you know, uh, cut me off perhaps uh, uh, in the evening when they knew I had to get up and actually accomplish something the next day. So uh, it was a lot of time. I mean, I tell folks, you know, it was twenty plus years, what a million and a half dollars, you know, uh, a few broken relationships. Uh, missing left neck and uh, uh, and finally uh, success. <laughs> yeah, certainly a lot of trials and tribulations on the way, it sounds like. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today too was Camp 4. I think uh, we had a little bit of a conversation on, on what that, what actually, where that's placed on, on the, uh, the mountain. So can you Tell everybody, you know, what happened at Camp Four, some of the experiences from that point on. Yeah, I mean, for me, once you get to Camp Four, which I'd never been to before, I mean, in itself, for, for me, it was a huge, huge accomplishment. I mean, we went basically after we got acclimated after what five or six weeks, we went from base camp to Camp One, and then Camp Two the following day, and then Camp Three up the Lotsey Face, and the Lotsey Face is very, very steep. And when I, I remember getting arriving very late into camp three, and I remember thinking to myself, there's no way I can go back down to base camp. And uh, I just won't have the strength. My entire right side of my body was, I mean, I woke up from camp three the following morning. It was so sore. My arm was sore. My sh right shoulder was sore. You know, just trying to sort of bust through the ice as I made my way to camp three. And uh, I was talking to somebody about this early this morning, and that was probably that morning, I remember putting on my backpack and uh, Nima Dawa Sherpa was with me. And uh, we started climbing from Camp 3, headed toward Camp 4. It's a very long sort of traverse at roughly, what, 7,700 meters or, you know, 25,000 feet, let's say. It's over 24,000 feet. It's a very long traverse uh, over to, to Camp 4. It's very, very steep there as well. And I just stopped after climbing about 20 or 30 meters. And Nima looked at me and he said, you're, you are right. And I just, honestly, I just sat down. I was so tired. I hadn't even got to camp four yet. And I was so tired. And I remember looking at Nima and I said, Nima, I don't know. I just don't know. And I sat there for a few minutes and hand to heart, I immediately started reflecting on some of the members that came with me to base camp that had survived some pretty horrendous accidents and ended up being a person with quadriplegia or a person with paraplegia or you know, perhaps somebody that had never really ventured outside of their comfort zone that was just there for that reason only, you know. And I was like, Guller, at least you can do, you can, you can stand up and, and you can put one foot in front of the other and just keep your freaking head down and, and keep moving. And honestly, it took me forever, it seemed, to get to Camp 4. And Camp 4 is, you know, roughly at 8,000 meters, well, at 25,000 feet, let's say, and, uh, or, and they call it the death zone for a reason because at that altitude, basically your body just starts, it starts breaking down. And the idea for most, most folks that, that make it to camp four is that you rest for a few hours that same day, drink some tea, try to hydrate, kind of get your head, head in the game and actually pack your, your summit gear and leave camp four that same night. And then of course you want to try to get summit as fast as you can and then all the way back down to even perhaps camp two or camp one before returning to base camp so you can get low and get safe, right? But I got to camp four so late and I was so tired when I got there, there was like no chance that some of the attempt was happening that night. And then the, you know, the next day I started feeling better. I'm there with, you know, some very, very dear Sherpa friends of mine, you know, we're all kind of hung in the tent and the wind started just howling and howling and just like banging our tents and banging our tents. And Nima Dow, he says like, he tells the story the best. He's like, oh, my God, Jared, I don't know what, what we're going to do. We're sitting holding the sides of this tent up, right? And I'm thinking to myself, my God, I've already made it to Camp Ford. If this wind continues, then, then this thing will soon be over because it's not like you can stay up there for too many days. So after a couple of days at, uh, at Camp Four. You know, finally, we had to make that decision. I mean, do we, we make the push tonight or do we descend? And I remember looking at Nima and I started to unzip that tent probably about 730 at night. 
And when I got that zipper to the other end, I swear on my life, it was like the wind just stopped. I mean, it just stopped. And I looked at Nima and I looked at a couple of my Sherpa friends. Nam Gay was there. Don Nima was there. Pim Tinting was there. And I said, let's go. And, you know, it took us a while to get all our kit and our gear ready. And, yeah, we thank God the wind stopped. And uh, we decided, you know, that moment right then, you know, at roughly, what, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, we're about to walk out into the middle of the night at you know, 25,000 feet. I was like, okay, game's on. That's, that's insane. So, and, and just in case anybody doesn't know this, when we say, when Gary says camp, you know, it's not like a KOA campground by any stretch, right? <laughs> it's a, you're at altitude, it's freaking freezing. There's no oxygen. You're sleeping on the side of something that you don't want to roll off of. You know, there might be Yeti up there. There's a lot of things going on, right? So, um, yeah, and from there, Gary, I know Hillary Step is a very famous um, transition point on the way up to, ba- uh, up to the, the summit. So, man, what was your experience at Hillary Step? You know, I mean, I, I, from Camp 4, it was very, very dark and it was, it was very very steep and uh it's like it went on forever and i do remember the sun coming up roughly uh they call it this area called the balcony and so if you look at a, an image of, of everest this little bit this little sticks out and it, and it looks like a kind of like a balcony if, if you wish and we got to the balcony as the sun was coming up and i remember watching the sun come up and it was like you could see all the way into uh, tibet into china and then south, and it seemed like you could see all oh, like Kerala, like southern Nepal. And, you know, from there, you can see the southeast ridge, and you knew that's a number of hours to the south summit. And, you know, we, we made pretty good time at that point, made it to the south summit. The Nima dropped down in front of me, and, of course, there's this knife edge. It sort of seems like it goes on forever. And, you know, I kind of followed Nima, and we're just kind of, you know, dancing on the edge there. And uh, uh, before I knew it, we came with this small little head wall, this little awkward sort of rock formation called the Hillary Step at 28,000, what, 800 feet, you know, and all of a sudden, Nima just, he just kind of jams up at, you know, super, super quick, right? And it's kind of awkward shape, and it's just weird and, and funky for just about anyone, right? I'm sort of stuck at the bottom of this thing. I've got, you know, one arm, of course, and I'm thinking, there's no bloody chance. I mean, there's just no way. And after about 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, sure, people have the best patience and, and out of any type of person I've ever met in my life, right? But Nima sort of yells down at me, he's like, Color, I'm really exposed up here. You need to do something. I mean, you need to do something quick. And, you know, I had come too far at this point, right? I mean, when I'm in Texas, you know, or back in Texas giving a, a speech or I'm invited for something, I always tell the Texans, but I've never played the game, Texas Hold'em, right? Or whatever it's called but I was all in at that point I was all in and I just figured up figured out this way to get my crampons partly in some eyes and scrape the other ones partly on the rock and I got sort of halfway up it and I swear on my life I'll never forget this as long as I live I just froze I mean I freaking just froze and I looked between my legs and I saw nothing but air for like 10,000 feet. It seemed like forever. And it was straight down all the way to the Karte Valley in Tibet. You know? And I remember thinking, and it's almost saying to myself, it was like, Guller, Guller, you got to see this one through, buddy. I mean, you have got to see this through. I mean, right now. And it was really one of those moments in my life when you know, hand to heart, I, I said to myself, it's all right, you know, give yourself the permission to succeed. You know, give yourself that permission right now. You, you, you've you earned this, you know. And once I sort of had that belief and I gave myself that permission, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe a big cloud just came and picked me up, you know, but it landed, put me right beside Nima Dawa. <laughs> he looked at me and and I looked at him sort of the same way we looked at each other at Camp Four when the when the wind stopped, you know. And uh, uh, at that point, you know, 
you, you know you're getting close. Uh, for most folks, I think it's about an hour or so from the Hillary step to, or the top of the Hillary step to the summit. And, uh, you know, I had to take, you know, had to check a few things and uh, uh, I knew we were gonna make that, that, that final push. That's amazing. That's like, um, that's like the, the Marine Corps crucible times a million, you know, <laughs> there's just, you know, that's gotta be, you know, such, um, you know, once you finally got up there, that's gotta be like the greatest feeling of accomplishment of all time. You know, I can, I can only imagine what that feeling would be like. Um, you know, I tell you, it's, it's, it's uh, honestly, uh, Jason, I, it's a feeling I can recall very, very often. And I hope that feeling never, ever, ever, ever goes away. Uh, I mean, I tell folks and audiences, uh, you know, all around the world that uh, when I listen to the, let's say the ABC World News Tonight clip, you know, sometimes after they introduce me to go on stage, you know, I tell folks, you know, my heart starts racing like nobody's business. My hands start getting sweaty. I start getting extremely nervous. I've done it thousands of times, you know, all quarters of the And every single time still, you know, when I hear my name, Gary Guller and, and the summit, you know, uh, it's still hard. It's, it's still hard for me to believe. And, you know, I can recall like it was a minute ago, you know, my head, I was so tired. I couldn't even pick my head up. I was studying the tops of my climbing boots in fine detail right never thinking i was ever going to make it to the <laughs> summit and then uh, and then it seemed like you know it was probably about an hour and a half or so and then i feel this this tap on my leg and i'll never forget my friend nima dow telling me said gary congratulations congratulations and uh i remember raising my head up and i mean i couldn't believe it you know i saw the i saw these little tiny prayer flags just blowing you know, on, on top of the world. And, and, and in all honesty, it's like, I, I, even at that point, I didn't believe it, right? Until I looked to the east and I was looking down at the summit of Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain in the world. And I could see Kanchenjunga, far eastern Nepal, you know, the third highest mountain in the world. I could see, <laughs> and then I could look like to the northwest and I'm seeing all these other 8,000 meter peaks. And I'm like, and I'm above them. And there was no place higher that we could go. There was no place higher. And you know, after the, the last 20 or 30 feet, as I said at the very beginning, you know, of our chat, you know, I do remember very, very clearly, you know, as clearly as one can think after a, a number of days above 25,000 feet, right? But I do remember thinking clearly enough to where, you know, at least a few of these last feet to the summit were for all those people that never gave up on me that never ever gave up on me. This is for you. This is for all of you. And, you know, when I got to the summit, I'm there near to the day Sir Edmund and Tenzing uh, stood on top of the world, you know, 50 years prior at that time. And no one is, no one else is at the summit but me and my four close group of friends. And like when we got to the summit, we immediately just all got down on our, our, our or sort of our hands and knees and it was like our heads just all touched each other and everybody prayed I guess in their in their own way and then um, uh, after some tears and then everybody of course started taking pictures you don't have a whole lot of time up there and uh, Nima hands me the phone he said Gary make the call make the call and uh, at that moment I turned up the walkie talkie and we had to sort of channel it through camp two and uh you know, I remember saying, you know, summit team, summit team, call into base camp, call into base camp. We're standing on top of the world. We're standing on top of the world. And, you know, I don't know. Um, in my heart, it seemed like I could hear everyone celebrating, everyone. And that's, to me, was just one of the many reasons that it was all so worth it to me. Because, see, it never... It never was about a guy with one arm standing on top of the world. Sure, it was part of it, but that's not what this exhibition was about. It wasn't about a guy in, with paraplegia or quadriplegia making it to Mount Everest base camp, sometimes having to be carried. It wasn't about a person that's never been on a camping trip before making it to Mount Everest base camp. It was about, I mean, if you think about it, this was about 
this collective force of people wanting to work together and making something happen. And knowing that on this scale it had never been achieved before and still took it on and was successful. You know, I mean, personally, I think it's one of the best examples. I'm just glad, thank God I was part of it, of, you know, people coming together, working collectively, working independently, and making it happen for something much greater than one particular person. And that's why, you know, I, I can stand proud. I can stand proud of the team. I can stand proud of the porters, the Sherpa, the sponsors, the all the people behind the scenes that made it happen, you know? Uh, and it's just strong now, the energy and I think the fall of compassion toward other people to unlock their potential. I think it's strong, if not stronger now than it perhaps has ever been. Because I think despite what's going on, everything that's going on around the world at the moment, the things that I'm noticing and seeing is a softer side to a lot of people, compassion and understanding. And, and really taking note of one, how short our life is and how important it is to see that in person when possible with the folks that mean the most to you. And when we're all on that same page, you know, it doesn't have to be the summit of Everest or, you know, driving a Formula One car in Italy or riding a bike. It could be a 2K, a 5K, a 10K, your first marathon, you know, um, just trying something new and people being supportive of you trying it. That's the, that's the, that's the trick, right? That's the beauty. And the finish line is, is, is awesome, but it's the journey that it took and the people that were with you to get you to that front, that finish line. That's, that's the beauty. That's the lessons, right? That's the lesson. And, you know, that, that's, that brings so many cool stories on, you know, teamwork, willpower, you know, everything in between just to get your, yourselves up there. I, I wonder how many people, you know, get up to that point where it just sucks and turn around. You know, in comparison <laughs> to the people that go all the way to the top, you know what I mean? Like how bad? Yeah, I think I think a lot. I think it happens to a lot of people. I think I've seen it happen to myself. I've seen it happen to many friends. I've seen it happen, you know, four days into a trek to base camp, you know, or at base camp or at camp two. But you know, as I as I just said, and as I said a a million times before, you know dead last or did not finish is a hell of a lot better than did not start right absolutely and uh, i always have my hat off and my hand out to anyone that you know just takes it on or gives something new a, a, a try i mean we don't always we don't all succeed we don't always have to succeed but you know the success sometimes is just kind of i, I always say sometimes the hardest part for me is putting my tennis shoes on and getting up front door once i'm out the door I'm, I'm off and I could be off for a long time, but sometimes the biggest Everest or head wall for me is actually getting out the front door. And, you know, I think uh, that's the same for a lot of people when it comes to trying new things, you know, perhaps they've had some bad luck in the past or perhaps they haven't been as successful as they wish, but uh, uh, you know, you got to keep trying and keep going after it. I mean, you know that Phil, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business guy, you know, we, 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 sometimes we go up and sometimes we come down as they say in, in or the Sherpa say, you know, how do you describe Nepal, Mr. Sherpa? Well, it's a little up and it's a little down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, how you mentioned, you know, how it can be so hard to get out of bed sometimes and just get out the door and just get started. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, David Goggins before, but he's a, he's a, a former Navy SEAL, best-selling author, motivational speaker. Um, the guy did what, three or four marathons or something like that. And then they segued into ultra marathons and in a matter of like spread out in a, you know, a couple of weeks. Right. So the guy did like a thousand miles on his feet and now he runs what probably 20, 30 miles every day. And he says, you know, I'm conditioned. I've done it. I've hit my goals, but I can't stop. 
And sometimes I just sit on my bed and I feel like a piece of garbage because I just don't want to go. But I know once I take that first step, you know, the next step's going to happen, the next and the next and the next. You know? So it's just like you said, you know, sometimes it's doing it, getting out there, getting your foot out the door and making it happen. Yeah, no, I mean, that's very true, Jason. I mean, thanks for sharing that, you know, and that, that just reminds me, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, be part of the marathon de Saab in the Sahara, you know, it's a multi-stage uh, running kind of uh, race over six days, you know, 150 plus miles or whatever. And, uh, you know, every time I think about one, why the heck did I do that? I mean, I'm not a runner, right? I mean, I'm a Clydesdale of anything on a good day, right? I'm not a gazelle. I'm not, you know, 120 pounds, right? But I wanted to take it on and, and it hurt, right? But I tell you the when I look back, it wasn't the hurt that I look back on. It was the connections that I made, especially that I'm still in touch with that, you know, sometimes you didn't even speak the same language, but you sort of made that eye contact with somebody, let's say 43 miles into, you know, a particular long day session, you know, in 130 degrees heat in the freaking Sahara Desert. But all of a sudden you just made an eye contact with somebody and for a split second, for a millionth of a second, you were so connected, like you've known each other since you were babies, right? But that was just enough encouragement, like just what you said, Jason, just enough encouragement to just keep going, keep moving and just keep like trying and keep trying and keep trying. Because we all know once you kind of break through those challenges or break through that boundary, of those self-imposed limitations. Oh, my God, that's that's sweeter than just about any thing I could possibly imagine and you know again it doesn't have to be in the Himalayas it doesn't have to be in the Sahara <clears throat> you know breaking through that first mile is huge for some people doing that first 5k is huge ever huge right and then you know at least they know whether they come back and do it again or not but at least know they they, they, they could they could complete it right Absolutely, man. And, you know, it's like, you know, <coughs> lack of a better term, you ascend. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Pun, pun not intended, but yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Um, oh, man. Yeah, really good very stuff. good, Go guys. Very, very good. We've got some videos for you. Um, I have the ABC video up. Do you, do you want to show it, share it with the audience now? You know, I've seen, like I said earlier, yes, I mean, why not? I've seen that video more than 20,000 times in my life. And every time I see it, for the, it's like the very first time. So, sure, I think that's a good thing to share. Yeah, let's do it. tonight about human achievement and the quest for overcoming obstacles and they come from the sports of mountain climbing and golf mountain climbing first and mount everest which has fascinated man for centuries it is foreboding it is beautiful it is mysterious abc's mark litke is at mount everest it's been a remarkable week of firsts on the world's highest peak but perhaps the most inspiring first today was that of 36 year old american gary gullick who lost his left arm in a climbing accident four years ago. He had led a team of Texans with disabilities on a grueling 17-day trek to Everest Base Camp, a remarkable Everest first in its own right. But then Guller immediately began his own assault on the summit, the first attempt by a climber with one arm. It was treacherous from the start, as fierce winds slowed his team's advance for days. <laughs> But as fast as it deteriorates, weather can suddenly improve on Everest. And after a 17-hour final push today, Gary Gullard stood on top of the world. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, like, I, love that like I said earlier, you know, I, I've seen that thousands and thousands of times. But uh, even just watching it now, you know, my heart just like, do -do 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 and my hands are nice and sweaty. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think you can tell in my voice I'm starting to talk really, really fast. So... <laughs> That's a that's a good side. I hope that feeling uh I hope that feeling never goes away. Thanks for sharing that. It's great. It's great memory.
Yeah, man, it's our pleasure. Yeah. I'm happy to be able to share this with, with everybody else. Yeah, and uh, Jason, do you have the uh, Team Everest trailer? Are you able to share that too? On the, on the PowerPoint? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, see if you can. And, you know, I know we've uh, kept you long on, a, on an important day, Gary, and I think you, I know you're going to spend some time with uh, Drea, and I know you're going to spend some time with yourself, just, you know, reliving these moments, and, and, and you deserve that. So we don't want to take up much more of your day, man. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thoughts around taking that first step forward, as hard as it may be, you know, mm-hmm. And sometimes for me, it's just like I'm looking at some things I have to paint. I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that, you know. So that is a little less challenging than summoning Everest from Camp 4. <laughs> so I feel you. I'm going to take that message with me today. We all have uh, something that's similar. Well, you guys, uh, I appreciate it. As always. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, well, uh, I'll I tell you what. I appreciate seeing you guys, of course. And uh I appreciate the time, and yes, you're right. It's uh, it's time to uh, celebrate and enjoy a little bit today, and reflect on the uh, the people in the Sherpa. You know, I've got a conversation with the with the team uh, later tonight, and uh, you know, of course, remember my friend Karma, uh, Karma Sherpa, and uh, you know, think about all the people that uh, again that uh, were with me on this uh, on this journey. You know, uh, I don't know if I'd wish my life on anybody else. Uh, I'm not quite sure if that's a really good idea. Right, but uh, you know, you you make mistakes, you learn, you climb higher, you move on, and uh, you know, you just try to look, uh, look at tomorrow how we can be better and try to be better anyway. And uh, uh, but in the interim, or for the next four or five hours, it's uh, yeah, it's a cold uh, adult beverage, uh, perhaps some little barbecue, <laughs> and then some good Sherpa conversation uh, later on. So, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Gary. Our pleasure, my friend. Have a blessed day, buddy. Okay. We'll talk soon.